Hello and good morning everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today uh, for the second session in our Nature Inspired Solutions Summer Webinar Seminar Series. Um, this morning the focus is on Nature Inspired Manufacturing. Um, my name is Emma McKenna. I'm a Knowledge Transfer Manager for Emerging Technologies and Industries at the KTN. And I will be your host this morning. I'm joined by an incredible lineup of speakers. So I'm going to try and keep my intro as short as possible so we can kind of get into the content and the detail today. Um, as usual, just want to run through just kind of some housekeeping with you, just due to the large number of people that are registered. Um, everyone will be muted. But after testing your speakers, please do remember to connect to your audio by using the join audio um, at the bottom of the screen or dial in by a phone using the number provided in the join instructions. If you do have any technical problems, then please use the chat to seek advice to, um, from one of my colleagues, Puna, who's our events manager, who's on the call as well today, um, and she'll be able to help with anything like that. Um, throughout, if you do have any questions um, for any of our speakers, then please do pop those in our Q&A box. Um, if the question is for a speaker in particular, please do note which one it is directed at. Um, myself and my colleague, George, who's also on the call, will be kind of keeping an eye on that Q&A box and making sure that we pull those, together, those questions together for the Q&A session at the end of this um, session this morning. Um, please don't use the Q&A box for any technical questions or any technical problems. Just do you pop those in the chat um, box just so they don't get lost or anything like that. But hopefully we shouldn't have any technical issues this morning, fingers crossed. Um, just also want to make a note that the webinar is being recorded um, and this will be made available afterwards from our website. Um, so yeah, just be mindful of that as well. Um, just to kind of run through the quick agenda, so I'm just gonna do a very quick you know, a bit of housekeeping and a bit of an intro to kind of set the context for the session today. Then we've got four incredible speakers, um, Sylvia, Jillian, Mark and Rupert, um, followed by a quick Q&A and summary. Um, they all have incredible presentations lined up that I myself am really excited to hear this morning. So hopefully you will enjoy them as much as well. Um, in terms of kind of why we wanted to pull this um, session together, we're really, I'm really pleased to have had the help from Mark to be able to pull together some of these incredible speakers. Um, but also as well as that, if you wanted to continue the conversation after the session today, there is the opportunity to use our Mojo application where you can sign up and book one-to-one -one meetings with um, the other attendees as part of this to continue the conversation and keep that going around Nature Inspired Solutions or manufacturing. Um, in terms of this, what is Nature Inspired? Um, I know that there is probably quite a mix of people here in the audience today. Some may be coming from a manufacturing background and interested to know what Nature Inspired is and how it can apply to their sector. And alternatively, we might have kind of Nature Inspired solution experts who are really keen to see how some um, of the, the researchers and academics that we have on the call today are looking at Nature Inspired um, and applying that to the manufacturing sector. So if you're unsure of what, man, um, what we mean by Nature Inspired, what we're thinking about is rather than imitating the whole plant, um, animal or biological process, Nature Inspired Solutions aims to uncover the underlying mechanisms and apply them in the design of new products, processes, systems in a structured way. If we look at nature, um, it, can it always seems to find the most efficient ways of being able to do things. And it also seems to be able to do that really well in harmony with its environment, something that we as humans aren't always so great at. So if we're looking at how nature does these things, then we're looking to see how we can apply them to um, really kind of strong sectors within the UK, such as manufacturing. And what we want to explore this morning is really around how nature inspired design um, what role it can play in modern, um, modern manufacturing and impact it could have within the sector. Um, and that's kind of really what we want to look at is kind of how nature can inspire better manufacturing. So I think less talking from me now and more um, talking from um, the experts. So our first um, presentation that we have this morning is from Dr. Sylvia Vignoli. Um, and she is from um, Cambridge University and an Associate Professor in Chemistry and Bio-Inspired Materials. Um, Sylvia is gonna focus this morning on um, 
how taking color from engineering and from um, practice or from nature and it's taking that into application. So I'm going to hand you on now to Sylvia to, to present. I'm going to talk about uh, taking inspiration from nature and not only borrowing the, the, the strategy and the design that nature using to make material, but also the material that nature, biopolymer that nature use itself. So just give me a quick uh, in introduction why color is so important and uh, we, we don't think about color too much but we are surrounded by color in our everyday environment because we use it mainly for communication and uh, we do it as, as animals because we, we exploit what color means for us and we use to recognize product to to see if someone else another a friend is not feeling well you you can see it from the color of the face so it's really embedded in our everyday life that we don't think about it. So appearance, color appearance is an important and extremely uh, developed uh, aspect of our society. And we exploit it a lot in industry in the context of making products that are appealing. So from, from the packaging that you can see of foods in the supermarket to cosmetic to paints and uh, every type of inks that you are using on a daily basis. So, uh, I, I think I, this, is, this is my interest and my expertise, and I think that nature has incredibly interesting way to create color that are actually not based on, on pigment. And uh, what I want to show you today and brief you, give you a brief overview is to just want to make you understand how nature can be a great inspiration to produce color in a more new and more sustainable way. And then how you can actually follow this uh, advice and they also exploit natural material to produce sustainable pigment for the, the new generation. And this pigment also can allow you functionalities that are not generally embedded in the standard the pigment that you have, for example, to color in your t-shirt or, or your watch. So let me just put a slide of the, actually the people that contributed mainly to this work because it's a, it's a really wide area. And especially I would like to thank and uh, Bruno that is actually the leading a lot of this uh, activity that I will show you in a moment. So when I say that you can make color without pigment, it's essentially saying that you can make color without using uh, any, exploiting only transparent material. So you don't need any specific chemical. So even with water, you can obtain color. Uh, but how you do that, and it seems strange, but if you see the slide, you look at the soap bubble, actually the way that you achieve this coloration is creating a really tiny, layer of water and this will interact with light with a phenomenon that is called interference and then you can actually pop up to start to see coloration even starting with a material that by itself is transparent and nature exploit structuring material on this scale on this nanoscale to produce a huge variety of coloration and this example that are called structural color are really first of all they can be really brilliant and really uh, strong and vivid also they have this uh, kind of what you call iridescent behavior metallic appearance that the color change in function of the angle but they can also be matte depending on the type of structure that you use and what is nice is that they use this uh, nanoscale material but they are made out of biopolymer so i think like even collagen that we have in our skin for example in uh, in some mammals like in this uh, baboons is exploited to produce this coloration. So you can start from any type of biopolymer that you like and make a color. We are mainly interested in polysaccharides because uh, one of the strategies that nature found to make coloration, it's actually assembling polysaccharides like cellulose and chitin. So these are material that we have, that essentially cellulose is the material that you find in every plant cell wall. So it's what you call fiber when you when you say you have a diet that is rich of fiber, so it's even an edible material, right? So you can assemble these fibers that are in the cell wall of plants in a specific way, which is called the helicoid. So you have that are stuck on top of each other, forming a sort of um, helix. And when, the, and when the length scale of this helix is comparable with the wavelength of the light, so that it's on the order of few hundreds of nanometer, like in the case of the soap bubble, then you can get coloration out of it. So just to have you visualize the idea, you have this fiber structure that are stacked up of each, other, of each other, like in this schematic. And if the scale is correct, so it's on the order of a few hundred nanometer again, you can really get color. And to show you just here, this is an SEM picture of, a, of this blue fruits, which is called Margaritaria. When you look it under the SEM microscope, you see that you have many different cells. 
that corresponds to epithelial layer. And this cell are essentially, if you want, stratified. And if you look with higher magnification, you can actually see that this uh, stratification is composed of many different fibers that are slightly tinted. And uh, this is what, and uh, if you see the length, the, the landscape is 200 nanometer. This is comparable with the blue wavelength of light, so you can reflect this blue strong uh, coloration. What is nice is that cellulose is not only found in these uh, special fruits, but as I was telling you before, cellulose is found in many plants and every plant cell wall. So it's actually one of the most, it's the most abundant biopolymer that you have available on the planet. And, uh, and cellulose, it's already a material that we exploit a lot for many other contexts. If you are sitting on a wooden chair, it's made of 40% of cellulose. It's used in the paper manufacturing, but it's also like a material that it's commonly used as a food additive for drugs. It's like, it's one of the most abundant polymer that we have on the planet and we are already starting to use it from, from textile to paper manufacturing in the most evident case, but also in many different uh, other forms that we don't par particularly conceive it. And the, the, one of the good advantages of cellulose is that actually it's, a, it's renewable and it's even edible and biocompatible. So the idea is that when you also try to exploit it to make pigments, to make coloration, and the answer obviously is yes, otherwise I wouldn't be presenting here today. And uh, actually you can extract part of the cellulose, this, this small fiber into a nanoscale object that are called cellulose nanocrystal, we call them CNC. And this one, they spontaneously form a structure that it's really similar to what you observe in the, in the cell wall of plants. In fact, if I show you this SEM picture, if you can recognize, you observe the same type of layering on the same landscape, but these are cellulose that is extracted from wood pulp. So you can, manipulate using the right, right, right chemistry, the cellulose, the cellulose material making it into nano. So these are called this nanocellulose, cellulose nanocrystal. And then you can control and you can make film, you can change the color, you can actually make them uh, really uh, flexible. Here you can also make optical effect. This is an hologram that it's actually made uh, simply on cellulose and you can see that it seems that it has a three-dimensional appearance, but actually it's uh, simply a 2D structure. And even more, you can even take extra inspiration from nature on the hierarchy on how actually in nature, the way that the cell wall is organized is wrapped around the sphere of the cell. And we can actually exploit this type of uh, concept to create even better way to, to make coloration. And actually we can self-assemble into droplets essentially and really control the assembly and produce really pigment-like particle of every different color from red to green to blue. And this one, they would be readily, that you can readily exploit them as, as normal pigment. And once you know how to control the material, you can really exploit it as a, as a normal pigmentation. This one could be inserted in a pigment formulation that, for example, you can paint uh, your wall with, or you can also then exploit it directly for printing with a, ink, with a printer. So this one was a, an old work that we have done where we can show that we can print red, green, and blue changing ink, and you can print it on different type of substrates. You can transfer the substrate, and what is nice also, since you have this chiral architecture, you can also have polarization effect, but uh, I, I don't have time to, much time to go into it. But what is nice is that you can now also print with inkjet printing, and uh, so really truly scalable manufacturing route, but using this more renewable material. And actually now we can also uh, in C to change the color by simply adding some salt into the suspension itself. So you, it's really, it's really nice. And uh, we can really go on large scale. We can create, uh, we can use roll to roll technique to deposit this material. This is an example of an, another type of cellulose called adroxypropyl cellulose that you can encapsulate it into a large uh, layer and we can use them as sensor because in this case, essentially the material is even pressure sensitive. And this is a material that you really eat, uh, that you can really eat. So these are like example of a picture of cakes that are decorated with the same material because this is material is probably you also have eaten it because it's one of the main component of, uh, of um, aspirin. And in the last uh, two seconds, I want to just uh, show you that uh, you, when you take inspiration from, from nature, you can even go a step further to bio inspiration, but you can start into the direction of bionics. And this is the direction that we are moving on, that we take 
the design structure has the recommended by nature and for example here in this case we we make a, a bionic uh, coral because we took inspiration from corals colors are great to optimize light and to redistribute light within the cell so we try to exploit the same mechanism creating artificial material that interact with living organism uh, in order to boost the photosynthesis for example or, or in here also to try to improve uh, the situation in the with the coral decline. So what we do, we use 3D printing technique where we can directly print algae within a matrix that essentially mimic from the mechanical point of view and, and for, from our aspect, the optical point of view, the tissue of a coral. And uh, we can boost the photosynthetic activity of algae that are encapsulated in this to, into this type of material. So nature is again, and for doing this, we all use only biocompatible solvent and biocompatible uh, materials that essentially are also, otherwise we wouldn't be able to grow the algae inside and we can use them to do other biophotoreactor or we have also some other we have started a small company to actually boost uh, productivity to use this algae then as fertilizer for uh, lower income countries so i hope i convinced you that optics is a really good way to uh, understand how you can uh, manipulate by self-assembly materials that are natural materials in a similar way of what is happening by, by living organisms and vice versa and living organisms could provide a really strong source of inspiration when it comes to design of visual appearance because these uh, organisms have evolved in the direction of trying to, Im to improve uh, their visual uh, appearance themselves in order to, to, to promote their survival. So I hope you you enjoy this talk if you are more keen we have a faraday discussion next week so it's still open so please uh, join and with this uh, i'll thank you for your attention i hope there are some questions later amazing thank you so so much sylvia that was fantastic and so interesting i think the first time we met you talked you kind of talked to me about kind of i suppose um color being formed and structures and i just thought it was so interesting and as you mentioned color is such an important part of our lives and we really kind of take it for granted and really don't think about kind of how it's formed so it's been really interesting to kind of go through that and i can see already there's some um questions coming in from the audience so that's brilliant so please keep them coming in um and we will pick those up um at the end um our next speaker that we have joining us um, this morning is Professor Gillian Vincent, who um, is going to talk to us about Much From Little. Um, this is his English translation of his title. He did have a Latin one, but unfortunately my Latin isn't so good, but I'm sure he will explain it. Um, uh, Gillian is an honorary professor of re um, in the Research Institute of Signal Sensors and Systems and an honorary research professor of the Nature Inspired Manufacturing Research Center. Um, Julian has finished his academic career as a professor of mechanical engineering, but he continues to have many ideas in his retirement. And I'm, for one, I'm really excited to hear some of those this morning. And he also is um, a source of inspiration, I have heard, for our following speakers as well this morning. So really, really great to have you here, Julian. Um, and if you're happy to kick it off your presentation, I'll let you take over. Right, so we start off with much from little. I'm going to stick with the Latin for the moment. Um, because here we have Descartes, uh, who famously said, um, cogito ergo sum, which is, um, I suppose, a fashionable way of saying, I think, therefore I am. Um, I once disturbed a girlfriend by um, uh, writing at the end of a letter, I rot, therefore I was. Um, but uh, that's terribly important, because if I don't rot, nobody else will ever follow me. Um, and I think that to a large extent, biological materials are um, designed, designed really, to uh, break down uh, and to um, be able to therefore be recycled easily. So that's going to be an underlying motif of, uh, of this discussion. Well, we go to an engineering system uh, and uh, we find that on the left hand side of the screen uh, we have uh, making something. Uh, the fact that it's made of metals doesn't really matter, it could be plastic or anything. But on the right hand side of the screen you can see that um, what we're really interested in is the materials that these things are made of. 
And actually, material selection tends to come rather downstream of, of the overall design process. Uh, somebody designs something and then thinks, oh, what now? What do I make it out of? Uh, and there's a guy called Eric Ashby um, from Cambridge who um, made very popular these Ashby diagrams in which he could plot the characteristics of a wide variety of materials. Here we've got strength and density and in the lower left hand corner you can see that we've got some biological materials. However, if you take density into account, we get a graph something like this. So specific strength, specific stiffness. Those specific terms mean those properties divided by the density. Um, uh, you find that biological materials cover pretty much the same area as engineering materials. Uh, we've got engineering alloys and ceramics sticking out of the top there, but for the rest of it, those are all biological materials. So they're very, very light uh, and their performance is pretty much up to the same standard as engineering materials. There may be problems with temperature, but I'll be talking about that a little bit later on. So biological materials, although um, for a long time in engineering, they've been regarded as uh, rather sort of secondary. Nowadays, they're becoming much more interesting. Um, and also this whole thing of working out how to recycle them. So if we can compare them here, you find that biological materials are made out of light common elements. In other words, things you can find anywhere. Um, a shovel full of, of, out of your garden will make quite a lot of things under these circumstances. Um, and uh, Sylvia has also already mentioned um, that uh, you've got hierarchical structures, that's very important, and I'll be talking a little bit about the liquid crystalline structures that she also mentioned, um, these helicoidal structures, uh, because essentially uh, nobody actually makes us, nobody actually makes a biological structure. We are all crystallized. Aristotle pointed that out. He said that um, there, there's, there is no, no body or no thing which can construct us. We have to design and make ourselves. So we are all crystallized and the way that happens is by the way that the molecules themselves assemble. Not only that, but uh, we're all hierarchical. Uh, this is because crystallization occurs at the molecular level, but if you're going to make a structure, then you have to have a hierarchical system so that those smaller crystals can interact with other ones uh, and start forming these structures. The Eiffel Tower is an extremely successful structure, it's very light, uh, but it gains most of its um, durability from the fact that it is hierarchical. So you can see all those little struts and things. I think that was mainly because it was difficult getting on site with a, a thing as big as the Eiffel Tower. And so they had to make uh, smaller bits and then bolt them together. But very, very successful. If we have a closer look at bone, we can see that we've got HA, which is short for hyaluronic acid, which, uh, sorry, um, hydroxyapatite, uh, which is a form of ceramic, and collagen, which is a protein. Uh, these then form a composite material, a fiber plus um, a solid, uh, and we get these nanofibers about 100 nanometers in diameter, and they can be assembled in a variety of ways so that we have these three or four levels of hierarchy and at the bottom, we've got bone, which goes from being antler, which is very, very tough, to the ear bone of the whale, which famously a guy called John Curry um, described as standing still in space, the, um, and, and the whale vibrates around it as, uh, as sound comes through the water. And that enables the, the whale to hear. So what's happening at the molecular level? The molecular level is very important. Um, and here we have some sketches of molecules which uh, as are man-made materials such as Kevlar, uh, which will form these liquid crystal structures, and there's some in the bottom uh, right-hand corner here. Cholesteric, you've already seen, but there are other sorts called pneumatic and smectic. These were discovered by a botanist, actually, in, um, in Vienna about 1850-ish. Uh, the problem is that the materials that we make liquid crystals out of, liquid, liquid crystalline structures, because those structures have to be stiff in order to be able to nestle against each other and not lose their shape too much, they tend to be made out of very high energy bonds. Uh, and so something like Kevlar, for instance, is um, a very strong material, but it cannot really rot. Um, we, we, 
we are have plastics of all sorts um, give, causing huge problems at the moment with pollution uh, and we can't get rid of them because they are very very high energy materials now here is the total opposite it's um, a molecule of collagen and you'll see that it's twisted at a number of different levels the diagram on the left is a sort of section down the column of um, a bit of collagen and on the right you've got this um, three strand rope like structure um, and you've got so you've got um, a helical structure both within each of those strands and also the strands themselves more importantly the whole structure is held together with relatively weak bonds but it gets its stiffness and not just from the fact that you've got those um, bonds um, along the length are fairly strong but the fact that you've got a larger diameter and so that through um, an engineering um, parameter called second moment of area uh, you get a doubling of the stiffness in bending at any rate if you increase the diameter of that column by about 20 percent so you end up with a stiff molecule but with relatively weak bonds and that's important because we now have um, we can have self-assembly we've seen some self-assembly structures forming colors um, here we have an experiment showing uh, the way in which these collagen molecules if you give them a template can lay themselves down um, in, uh, in these structures and become really rather high density packing and so you can get a, a very very stiff material such as the well we've got collagen but uh, the cellulose again um, that uh, make up plant cell walls are also very very stiff incidentally wood is the most efficient of all materials uh, you the flagpole in Kew Gardens is very famous because it had some sums done on it which showed you couldn't make a flagpole that tall out of any material other than wood uh, but that's just a, a, a minor story so how can you get this sort of orientation well pultrusion is a standard uh, technique which is used in engineering uh, and you can make these aluminium and steel structures as you've got on the um, upper right there but silk is produced in exactly the same way the sketch on the lower left shows you the aqueous um, suspension of silk molecules being forced through a very narrow channel and it's pulled out at the end of the uh, of the spider spinneret and by then the molecules have all become very very orientated not only that but from an aqueous material like that you can produce something which is essentially waterproof uh, so that silk uh, although it's made out of a water soluble molecule it can um, it can exist in a watery environment and the nice example of that of course is the caddis fly which can spill, spin silk underwater and again it doesn't dissolve so the fact that you're spinning something from a watery system doesn't uh, really affect things uh, and I've also got dogfish there which produces the most wonderful uh, really tough material in, the, in its egg case and there's a little sketch down there on the lower right showing the way um, you've got um, a layered system producing this egg capsule wall as it's pulled through the system there's a lot to get through with talking about biological materials in a relatively short time um, I'm a very very keen banjo and guitar player and a friend of mine um, Phil Davidson um, enjoys making um, really beautifully decorated instruments the sketch on the middle he, he assures me is his wife actually but that's um, a very limited edition of, uh, of instrument but mother of pearl you can carve it's 95 percent chalk chalk is a weak material um, its work of fracture as a, a parameter is about half a joule per meter squared if you go through to mother of pearl it's three thousand times that and yet mother of pearl is um, it is 95 percent of chalk it's the way it's put together and here's an example from some work done by a guy called Lars Berglund um, from Sweden where he has taken um, well montmorillonite which is actually clay um, and then he stuck it together with the glue um, from plant cell walls and then orientated it in a similar sort of way that you can do with pultrusion onto plastic 
Um, so he's made something which is very much like this Naker structure, which is um, a series of stacked platelets about oh, half a micron thick, uh, but using readily obtainable materials. Now here we have another of these Ashby diagrams, uh, and we've got Naker mimic material, this red blotch right in the middle. And you can see that this manufactured material is performing every bit as well as um, GFRP, glass fibre reinforced plastic, um, many porous ceramics, um, and a whole host of polymers. Now, one of the problems, of course, with plastics is the patent industry. And uh, I think we've got about 300 different basic patent, uh, uh, basic plastics, uh, but they all have to be made by different industries. And so they all have to be patented to protect their production. Um, in nature, we only have two polymers, proteins and polysaccharides, and they make all these biological structures. The advantage of that is not only you have weak bonds, but they all have pretty much the same bonds. And so the same recycling system, bacteria and fungi, will work for them all. Um, we have a lot of the assembly processes available to us. Though many of them are relatively simple. Uh, and um, on the left here, we've got the various characteristics of biological materials in order to manufacture them. Orientation and size I've talked about. Phase, I haven't mentioned. Um, the speed of production is always a problem with biological materials, but you start doing it in engineering and you've got a better chance of doing it before you go home for the evening. Um, gradients are very important, starting to get more important in, um, in technical materials. And cell structure has been well known for a long time as a way of making a very light um, structure. So um, as, as technologists, we are remarkably crude in what we do. We take a raw material um, and we bash it around and we melt it and we use an awful lot of energy and eventually we decide to give it some sort of order and have a product. We're essentially outside the system. What we have to realise, what we are starting to realise, is that actually we are the system. We are embedded within the materials which we wish to make and what we need to be able to do is to bridge that gap and that's what all this natural technology stuff is about um, and there's a paper you might like to have a look at here uh, Gregory Olson was published about 20 years ago but um, he was trying to look at the hierarchy behind all this and called he, he was calling it cause and effect um, and that's the synthesis bit but Biology goes the other way around. We have epigenetics, not just the genetic system giving in information, but epigenetics, which is the um, organism actually learning from the way in which it makes itself to make new types of um, structure within itself. And some of this can be inherited. And with that, I'll leave you with this thought. Thank you very much. Hi, Julian. Thank you very, very much for that. That was um, a really brilliant overview of kind of um, a lot of the stuff that you've done and looking at kind of those different aspects of that. And again, um, the role that nature has to play in that. And um, we're definitely getting lots of questions in and definitely if we seem to have a few fans um, in the audience as well that have also mentioned kind of how you've inspired their work in this area as well, which is brilliant. Um, Next up, I'm just going to quickly move on to, to Professor Marcus Milias, who um, has really kind, kindly um, helped me over the last kind of couple of weeks and months kind of pull together some of the amazing speakers that we've had for this session. Um, Mark is the Deputy Director of Research um, Institute of Sensor Signals and Systems at Harriet Watt. And in 2006, he founded the first UK nature inspired manufacturing centre. Um, so we will hand it over to you then, Mark, to, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. I hope you can hear me. Um, so what I'm going to, to explain is um, uh, how uh, one day one of my students uh, decided to use uh, spinach in order to grow metal onto plastic. And uh, so I'm going to explain the, uh, what has been uh, happening and, and why we, were, we decided to do that. 
Uh, first of all, I need to acknowledge the financial support from the EPSRC through the Manufacturing with Light program. And, and I would like to give my big thanks to uh, two key people who have helped me in this work, uh, Dr. Jose Marquez, Wezo, material scientist, and also Dr. Robert Kay at University of Leeds, uh, uh, who is able to, to make uh, ideas into, into manufacturing system quite effectively. So I described the motivation of why I decided to do that and, and also what has been the green chemistry and the other processes that was involved. So really the way we tend to, to manufacture metal tracks is a, a process um, using a traditional photolithographic process based on semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, additive manufacturing also can allows us not to do that in a, in a better fashion. And, and what I'm going to explain is how we can create, uh, uh, how we can form metal atom in situ uh, using uh, either of these three processes, uh, photo-induced thermal or chemical process, and, and why we want to do it. So the motivation is very much to, to look at uh, what we call the molded device interconnect. Um, so the idea is how can I be, um, how are able to, to print metal track onto a contour surfaces as you see on the left hand side. And, and there's a the German company, company uh, uh, has this uh, process, this self PKF process, and, and has been doing that quite effectively. But the idea was how can I do that using nature? That was uh, what we wanted to, to try to achieve. Now, you're not meant to read that slide, but it's just to explain to you, there, are, there is a lot of metallization deposition process which do not need a vacuum. And, and what we decided to do is to, to look at one particular one, which is uh, uh, highlighted in bold, to see if we can somehow uh, find, a, find a process which can accommodate basically the facility of using um, uh, equipment which can be uh, can be used in, in developing countries, so dipping processes, for example. So I'm going to explain uh, this kind of process in more detail and see how nature actually uh, help us doing that. But first of all, um, so there's a different way of you can reduce metal into plastic, metal ions into plastic. You can do it either using heat or you can using chemical reagent or you can use light. So there are various ways once you have metal ions embedded into a plastic, how you can bring these metal ions, you can reduce them and bring them back to the surface, which will create that seed conductive layer to create two metal tracks. So we decided, first of all, to look at a, a process which was uh, done by a Japanese person called Akamatsu. And he was using a, a synthetic agent, um, um, this uh, methoxypolyethylene glycol, this MPEG, um, and uh, it was a very simple process based on uh, uh, using a polyamide substrate. Uh, and you uh, dip that in a solution of uh, potassium hydroxide, a very simple dipping process. And then you dip that into a, a silver, uh, silver salt solution, silver nitrate solution. Uh, and you have an exchange between the, the actual uh, potassium ion and the silver ion. Uh, and once you have done that, you use that zinc coating, which in that particular case was this uh, MPEG coating and you use, for example, light in that particular example. And some for that zinc coating agent will allow you to provide the electrons in order to reduce the metal ions, which are being brought onto the surface as metal nanoparticles. So that was a synthetic process. And what we wanted to do is to find a way of getting rid of uh, chemically manufactured uh, uh, agent such uh, for that zinc coating. So this is a uh, this is really the process again explained into a greater detail. Um, it has the advantage of having very simple, as I said, the dipping process. So it it was a relatively simple process to use. Um, and the the the, the actual manufacture the way it was done is. Uh, uh, Kind of complex chemical reaction when the the, uh, the imide ring is being broken by the potassium uh, uh, hydroxide, and then you have the uh, exchange of the uh, of the silver with the potassium ion in order to create uh, this uh, silver uh, polyamide layer. And this is a kind of thing you could achieve with uh, uh, with a process. So you have uh, this uh, flexible substrate, and you can get some very good. Uh, a 40 micron line in space uh, for, for example, a solenoid. So that was quite a, quite a very good process. 
The problem with it, nevertheless, is that it takes a lot of hours of processing time, which for an industry is not economically viable. And you are using also uh, the light at, uh, at a very high energy, so UV light, which uh, created also some photo dissociation of the substrate underneath. So you, you, you have this kind of uh, uh, crater, uh, this kind of uh, uh, depression you find in the polyamide, which you do not want necessarily to have. So there, we, we had some problem with the actual process. And another issue was uh, the adhesion strength wasn't great in some cases. So, so we needed to really find a way, maybe using nature to allow us to, to create um, to create those metal tracks. And we decided to go for spinach. Uh, wh why spinach? Uh, it hasn't got this uh, waxy layer, so it's very easy to get directly to the, the chlorophyll, the chloroplast, when you are basically uh, uh, pulver pulverizing it. And it, it is also a man-made material, so you can, you can use it quite readily. And the, the, our original idea was to be able to see whether or not we could use uh, the photosystem one and two, so the chlorophyll basically, and to try to see if we could use artificial photosynthesis to, to bring, to, to, to get those electrons, which will allow to do the actual reduction of the metal ion, which was embedded into the plastic. So we thought that we could do that. And so here's my student uh, uh, using uh, basically uh, a traditional uh, uh, item you will find in your kitchen uh, to, to basically um, um, pulverize the actual spinach, do some de detoxification of spinach using uh, uh, some uh, ethanol, um, ethanol uh, material and get this kind of greenish, greening structure. And, and to our surprise, it did work. Uh, we were able to uh, use uh, uh, this kind of spinach extract uh, with uh, uh, and using 10 times less energy with a synthetic agent uh, gets a five micron feature with photo mask or 50 micron using this uh, direct laser writing. So we were thinking, oh, that's quite nice. We, we were able to use uh, artificial photosynthesis in order to create metal tracks. And you were able to get when these metal ions was reduced onto the surface, you could see this uh, nano island of, uh, of silver which would be used to, to create uh, sub, uh, then uh, further uh, electroplating of that silver. So we thought we had cracked it. In fact, we didn't. Um, so we realized, in fact, using uh, uh, lo looking at um, uh, polyetheramide, uh, derivative of polyamide, and, and using only chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, that we didn't get actually the metal tracks we, we had with some spinous extract uh, we used straight away or use, uh, using five days. So we were slightly perplexed about that. We thought uh, chlorophyll was the way to go. But in fact, uh, and this was a contribution of Jose Marquez Hueso, my colleague, he realized that actually what we were doing is we were extracting uh, all the salt materials associated with the spinach leaves and and it was actually the 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 uh, the chloride the potassium chloride embedded into those which were actually doing the trick so it wasn't at all related to um uh, chlorophyll it was still green chemistry but not the way we thought of and uh, the, the chemical reaction actually was indicated above and what we realized is we had recreated uh, black and white photography 150 years uh, later after NIEPS has done. But nevertheless, we, we found that we were able to get some very interesting uh, application. Uh, for, for example, using a, a 3D printing uh, element, we were able to do some electrolyte splitting using that chemical and do further electroplating um, uh, uh, using that uh, seed conductive layer on the 3D printing part. So that was actually quite, still quite interesting to achieve. And we were able to do also selective plating of, of uh, some materials onto uh, here, it was a substrate of ABS, and with resistance which were comparable with a bulk material. So, so we had basically a first layer of silver followed by a, a copper layer electrolytically 
uh, plated here and a very good resistance as well. So it was still, from a, uh, an industrial point of view, that, that is still an interesting proposition. And we have, uh, based on that, we have created a variety of various processes that uh, I do not have the time to explain, based not only on uh, uh, poly, uh, polyamide, polyacylamide, but also we were able to use PDMS. For those who are doing microfluidics, uh, will understand what I mean by that. Uh, also PTU, some semoplasty polyethane, and, um, and so on and so forth. And we were able to do silver, but also copper as well. So in summary, the, uh, the, 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 the minerals which were used in this plan, this abstract, you know, could be used to greatly enhance the photoreduction of metal ions. And we developed uh, several processes uh, which can be, do, can be used for uh, planar substrate, contour surfaces, uh, as well as uh, 3D printed and, and flexible substrate. So it's a, it's a very interesting low cost, uh, low environmental impact process uh, which is uh, being, uh, being contemplated. And this is a very nice picture that uh, my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Robert Kay, did from the University of Leeds, where he was able to, to combine all these processes, not only to create uh, uh, the 3D printing process, the metallization onto the 3D printing process, but also the ability to, uh, to surface mount electronic components and then some very nice videos uh, which are available, which uh, show the, the flexibility of the process and uh, all credit to the team at the University of Leeds. Thank you very much. That's all for me. Brian, thank you so, so much, Mark. That was really great and really kind of great to kind of see the, the journey that you had there and kind of when things worked and when they didn't work and kind of how you learn from that as well. So it was great to kind of go through the whole process of that as well. So thank you so, so much. And um, we are now going to move on to our um, final speaker of the morning, which is um, Dr. Robert Sewer. Um, Robert is an Associate Professor at the School of Architecture and Design and Built Environment in Nottingham Trent University. Um, and is going to talk to us about how permits can help us manufacture better 3D printing machines, which I'm very excited to, to learn and hear about. Um, just one thing to say, please do keep your questions coming in um, this morning. I know we're going to be really tight for time on the Q&A portion, but what we can do is we can extract those questions and, and make sure each of the speakers are able to kind of have a look at those and provide answers so we can send that in the follow-up. So please, please, please do keep them um, coming in as well. But um, for now, I'm going to pass you on to Rupert. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thanks to Mark for inviting me to come and give this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna quickly just run through what, I, what I'm doing, what my, my collaborators are doing, and how this may or may not influence manufacturing and in particular digital fabrication in the future. Uh, the place to start, if I can get my mouse to work, there we go. Um, as Julian so nicely put it, all of us are trying to do more with less. Uh, whether that's innovating in the face of resource scarcity or having a lighter footprint with a extraordinary population growth, for example. I came into this from computer aided design, scripting and digital fabrication or 3D printing. And because of my angle of construction, uh, I was kind of inevitably drawn towards termites. When we look at a termite mound, or indeed this photograph is a cross section, or uh, sorry, it's a casting of the channels and ducts inside a mound, or whether indeed we're looking through the cross section of a bone and we see the hydroxyapatite structures there, we're often left in awe uh, by the complexity, but also scratching our heads about the level of integration that we see. And this for me became the focus of my work. How does nature integrate so many functions seamlessly into a single solution and quite commonly from a single material? There's three points I just want to highlight in terms of what we've drawn from this discussion and they will lead into the rest of the discussion I'm going to give. The first point is, and Julian touched on this, is that in nature there is always a scarcity of resource. Those agents or organisms that work as collectives or swarms busy building and aggregating these complex structures are having to fight or compete for a very small amount of material. Something that relatively humanity and in, in the field of design and engineering we haven't had to do. The second point is that in nature 
there is neither form or function. These are communication tools that describe the spatial component of a form or the temporal component of what something does. And we need those to communicate and network with each other. What we have in nature is only processes enacted by agents who must assemble materials to capture or sustain the processes they are wanting to do in that moment at that time. And these processes are encoded at a genetic level and they are played out through the process of construction with the physical environment. And from there comes the phenotype. And the phenotype is that product of these two opposing forces that compete with each other to produce this highly dynamic kinetic solution through time. Right, good. <laughs> so what I do now um, is more the two elements the next two slides I'm about to show. The first is swarm construction robotics. Now, there's a lot going off in uh, ro swarm uh, robotics itself, but very little that's going off in physical construction or making of products and solutions. Because what we're interested in is taking swarm robotics and placing them in the physical environment to produce those phenotype solutions as new products and designs and capabilities for the future. But it's very difficult to get robots to communicate with each other, let alone build and aggregate matter in a structured way. So where we see great advances with swarm robotics, very little of it is actually making things in terms of manufacturing and products. The other side of the work that I do is generative design or agent-based architecture. This element is important because it allows us to see the phenotype because it gives us another level of description beyond form and function. Essentially, we have processes described as rules as code that can then be played out with any, uh, within any theoretically fabrication device. However, the environment that we create within the digital domain in terms of generative design is an artificial environment. It's never linked or rarely linked to the physical environment itself. There's no feedback. Now, equally within swarm construction robotics, as I highlighted, there's no physical feedback to the, the environment itself either. In fact, swarm construction robots, as we imagine them, are many years away, and we've got many technical challenges to overcome. So a few of us out there began thinking, well, what if we took some of these elements and brought them together with what we do already? So 3D printing platforms are actually excellent materialization uh, solutions, and they actually act like a little agent in their own right, except they only replicate geometry as slice data and produce products. What if we fed algorithms to the fabrication platforms and had those plat platforms or deposition devices sensorized sufficiently so they could sense the environment in which they're depositing in? Not only adding material, but also subtracting material. Not just one deposition head, but multiple deposition heads, each acting as an individual agent to be able to aggregate a solution as nature would. And not surprisingly, we call these phenotechnologies or phenofabricators is another way of looking at it. What we're doing is essentially add feedback into the system. I'm just going to give you an example of what we're trying to do by way of getting the idea across. So, you can imagine how a heat exchanger works in an engineering context and how we might go about it. Within the phenotech context, what we've got is a box in which we have two fluids. One is hot, one is cold, and we want to transfer heat from one fluid to another. Suspended above these two fluids, we've got a series of metal pins, by way of example, which can contract forwards or move backwards based on whether or what those pins are sensing as a temperature gradient within the pin itself. So not only does each pin can measure a temperature that it encounters, but also those of its neighbors to, de de to derive a, a gradient of temperature across it. And then we set an algorithm at work. We ask the algorithm to place pins where there is a gradient above or below or a certain threshold. Above a certain threshold of temperature, we ask the pins to intercept that gradient. And by intercepting that gradient, they start to flatten the gradient. 
Inversely, where the gradient is sensed that is too shallow, we ask the pins to withdraw so it steepens the gradient to bring the whole system within a homeostatic equilibrium. Essentially, what we can imagine then, as the bottom right image shows, is how this uh, boundary or interface forms between these two, whose foldedness is directly equated to the gradient or the flux that we want to move across it. And essentially what we have is a device that can then be modified in terms of its parameters. So we can say, find the equilibrium state for this uh, solution, and then find the new equilibrium state for another set of parameters. And we know that those pins will begin to modify and adjust themselves. So what we have now is not a product, which is a heat exchanger, sitting there hoping to work within a set range of parameters based on how we designed it. This thing is able to adapt and modify and persist within the environment that it actually exists within. Right. So what we've been doing in terms of trying to get into this idea is starting to go back to the termites. We've tried to find a termite construction algorithm. The image on the right shows one of the parameters that they're very attuned to, which actually is moisture. So termites sense moisture and moisture itself through evaporation and condensation at the scale of the termites but where they're building allows some very interesting physics to emerge and you can see how uh, convection cells emerge above a construction phase, and these are what termites sense and move to. So what if we take that construction algorithm and now load it into a digital fabrication platform? And that's what we're doing. We are essentially creating a simple 3D printer which can extrude mud or indeed remove pellets of mud from that interface. And we have sensors on board that deposition device that can sense the moisture gradient of, those, uh, of the construction site itself. And if we're right, we will have the 3D printer and the termites rebuilding a termite mound. Now, I'm sure that we will get some of those parameters wrong, but one of the neat things about agent systems and algorithmic systems is the deep learning capability. We can set this up so that we can have the machine converge on the algorithm that the organism is enacting, essentially by learning or modifying its own behavior to move within those parameters that are actually executed. So here we imagine machines that can interact directly, I'm just gonna switch my timer off, with nature, with organisms. So let's imagine you know, a, a bone fracture and, and an osteogeneration where we put two pins, one depositing and one subtracting, hydroxyapatite, and they can begin to interact with the osteoclasts and osteoblasts directly within the environment they're within, uh, working it out. Or a building uh, envelope, which can dynamically adapt to the changing and turbulent flows that exist around it. My final slide, my time is up, but if you want to see more about it, we've produced a video called A Moment of Convergence, and you'll see a lot of great people like Julian in there telling their stories and how this can all come about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. That was brilliant and super interesting to kind of see how those, yeah, how different things are kind of working together to be able to kind of help develop that learning and kind of see where things are going. It's a really, really fantastic look. And I'm definitely going to be checking out that video to, to learn a lot more. So thank you for that. And I just want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers this morning. We are running really tight for time, um, but I think most of the speakers have been kind of engaged and active in the Q&A box, trying to answer as many questions as possible. But I think we can probably try and squeeze in one. Um, George has been keeping an eye on the Q&A. So George, if you're able to share one um, question um, for our panelists this morning, that'd be great. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so thank you everyone for actually asking the questions. Uh, and as Emma has mentioned, you can actually check the answered section in the Q&A box. Uh, most of them have been answered, but I did collect one that can be asked to the entire panel. So the question is, what is the low hanging fruit in the search for new biomaterials? Uh, is it materials, manufacturing, or the disposal and recycle methods to focus on? Who would like to start? 
I don't know, I can give you my, my view. I think it's like low hanging fruits. There are several technologies that are there ready to be invested on. That's at least uh, what I see. The problem is like, at least in my sector, there is a really, uh, there is a struggle of initial investment because what we have noticed as well, like even if you demonstrate manufacturers, the material are a bit more expensive. And when you look into high volume, high throughput and things like that, I think it's, um, the main limitation it comes on the, on the cost that you have to 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 invest in order to develop this uh, this technology. So, the, in my opinion, other government uh, takes some action in order really like to promote this type of interaction in a, in a real and promote sustainable material by bio, bio inspired material, but really like using more biomaterial for for this application than. Uh, then it's really difficult to enter in the sector, especially with established uh, established uh, companies. I see that now some sectors are moving much faster than others, where the the public opinion is much more stringent into their into their consideration, like cosmetics or food. You see that there is a much more also willing on investment that they have done also on our technology than other more. Uh, established uh, big industry and manufacturer but the point is like the problem is that often the know-how of this big uh, company chemical company at the end that would be like really beneficial to this technology because uh, through collaboration i think you would achieve much faster much more uh, economical and viable solution to this type instead if you you know if you always rely on smaller company startup uh, it's um, for manufacturing it's a challenge because that's uh, that's that that is in my opinion the main problem. So there are there is a lot of potential and a lot of low hanging fruits, but they need to be taken by the one who actually have the manufacturing potential. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, Rupert, I see you want yeah, to. Yeah, I I would uh, just try and take a slightly different angle in the response to that. In that to say. Once you have uh, agents, whether they're organismal or mechanical, working with materials and become to and start to mimic the processes that are enacted in nature, then simple materials start to become very smart once they are under the regulation of smart organisms. If you see it, there's a direct transference of the intelligence of the organism regulating the material. So when we look at termite mounds and how clay responds, it's a fairly benign material. But once we start to look at the structured topology of the ventilation ducts and how moisture interacts with that system, everything starts to become very complicated and super smart. Yes, please, Julian. Uh, yeah, uh, I can um, expand on that a little and say that uh, some years ago we looked at um, the importance in terms of solving problems of um, half a dozen parameters, stru substance, structure, energy, space, time, and information uh, across all technology and uh, similarly with biology. And one of the outstanding things we found was the importance of information in um, the way in which materials and structures are um, manufactured and controlled uh, in um, biological systems. And so as Rupert says, the uh, importance then of the agents in terms of applying what's a basically a sort of intelligence into the structure of the materials is of, of, of huge importance. What that then does is allow you to put materials together at lower temperatures because um, they ca they're controlling the bonding much better than the sort of bucket chemistry that we do at the moment. Uh, and that, of course, in turn means that those materials can be uh, broken down and uh, re reassembled at much, much lower temperatures with lower energy consumption um, and stuff like that. Uh, in fact, somebody asked me the question, uh, can these materials exist at higher temperatures? Well, of course they can. Uh, plastics are processed about 120 degrees centigrade, and I think that's their big problem. Uh, if they could be processed at a much lower temperature, then uh, we would be able to uh, recycle them in the same way that we ourselves are recycled. Um, we tend to go at about 40, 45 degrees centigrade. That's something like the lethal, um, lethal temperature. Uh, so that's all to do with uh, basically energy recycling and, and temperature and heat resistance. 
Perfect. I, I saw you, Mark, that you're nodding. So if you have uh, anything to add to the answers. I, 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 think, I think what uh, my colleague said is, uh, is, is totally right. I mean, uh, I, I think I, I would look at, at a specific topic, which is really looking at material for disassembly. So this, uh, if we were able to embed, embed this information as, as to when and, and how we can disassemble materials, uh, as they are being uh, used for products, I think that would be, we will go a long way towards uh, uh, the the actual wastage we have. So, uh, so I think you know the the, the avenue of research for my for my particular uh, um, res uh, avenue, uh, my particular um, strive is is really to see how can I embed information into those materials which I can trigger in order to do disassembly. This is what I would be looking forward in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will pass it on to Emma now for the final remarks. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much. And thanks, George, for the, the question. That was brilliant. And um, yeah, I definitely think the, you know, the design for disassembly is definitely something that's very interesting. Um, circular economy is an area that I've worked in for a number of years. And it's definitely something that we need to kind of understand how we can do this and do it better again to kind of prevent waste and think about kind of how we move towards cleaner growth and environmental sustainability within the UK and, and much further afield. Um, I just want to thank, um, say thanks once again to our, our amazing lineup of speakers this morning. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I have learned so much uh, and feeling positively inspired about some of the incredible work that's going on here within the UK. And I'm really excited to see kind of where this is going to go. I just wanted to finish um, just uh, a quick kind of summary around kind of um, just to explain why this kind of webinar um, happened this morning. It was brought to you by our Nature Inspired Solutions Special Interest Group, um, which I lead on here at the KTN and it's been running for over a year. Sylvia and Mark are actually both really active members within the Special Interest Group and both sit on our advisory board. So we're really, really lucky to have such kind of um, amazing experts part of that. Um, the purpose of the Special Interest Group is to, um, it focuses on three application areas, which is transport, energy and infrastructure structure um, and it's really around bringing together a diverse community and um, raising the profile of this sector um, around kind of helping develop ideas for collaborative projects and really looking at identifying unmet needs within tar those target industries and um, we have a lot to do to try and achieve kind of overcome some of the challenges that we have here within the UK as I mentioned, particularly around clean growth and around um, things like net zero as well, but also kind of very specific um, challenges within um, a wide range of industries that we kind of really rely on here heavily within the UK. And what we want to look at is kind of how nature inspired solutions is potentially one of those methods and approaches that we can use to look at how you might overcome some of those challenges and look at things in a very different way. And that's why we want to bring together quite um, a broad range um, of organizations and individuals that are active in this space. So if you are interested, please feel free to, to get in contact with me, but there's also information available on our website and we will be sharing that as well um, after this event, along with the recording um, of this. And um, if you are, as I mentioned, this is the second um, kind of session in our summer webinar series. We have two more um, sessions coming up in August. The next one is on August 4th, and that's going to be focused on clean energy and resource efficiency. Um, and that's in collaboration with UCL and their Center for Nature Inspired Engineering. And then our final session is on August 28th, and that will be focused on future flight. So all the details are available on the website. We'll also share those um, with you in our follow-up email. Um, but if you are free and available to join them, please do that. Um, I know that we didn't get through as many questions as we would have wanted to, but hopefully the panel were able to answer as many as they could um, in the Q&A box. So do check the answers in there. Um, but we will pull out the questions and we'll try and get some of those ones that we didn't get answered and um, followed up. But if you do want to continue the conversation, then please do um, visit the link um, that I am sharing here on the screen at the moment. This is a great opportunity to kind of connect with other people that participated um, 
uh, on the call today um, that are active in kind of the manufacturing sector or want to discuss kind of nature inspired in this area. So please feel free to kind of join on there um, and book one to one meetings with others. But other than that, I just kind of want to say a huge thank you again um, for everyone that joined us today. Thank you so, so much and sorry for going a little bit over. Um, but hopefully you don't mind and you've hung around because you really enjoyed it as well. Um, and thanks once again to all of our amazing speakers. Um, take care and we'll hopefully see you in a couple of weeks for our next session. Bye.